In this video, we'll talk about the higher level content from C1.3 on photosynthesis, particularly the light independent reactions. The light independent reactions are more commonly known as the Calvin cycle. And before we get into the details, let's just take a broad view here. The Calvin cycle is in fact a cycle, so you're gonna hear me talking about it starting and then ending with the same molecule. And there are three basic phases to the Calvin cycle, or at least it helps me to think about them that way. So we'll talk about the phase called carbon fixation. We'll go through that first. And then we're gonna go through some reactions that are all revolving around reduction. And then we'll get into the last bit of the cycle um, that has to do with RUBP regeneration. And it's okay if we don't know what that is right now, but I just want you to have a general idea about these three big phases in the Calvin cycle. Now we'll talk about this carbon fixation part first, and then we'll go through and outline the rest of this cycle. Carbon fixation revolves around two molecules, Rubisco and RUBP. Now RUBP stands for ribulose biphosphate. It's okay if you abbreviate it as RUBP in your writing, but you need to also be able to recognize its longer form. And the same goes with Rubisco. So you're allowed to use this abbreviation, but Rubisco actually stands for ribulose biphosphate carboxylase, okay? So it's named after this molecule. Ooh, but it has this word carboxylase on the end. ACE should make you think of enzymes. So this is an enzyme that's going to add a carboxyl group to RUBP. Great, I love it when things are named after what they do. So in this process of carbon fixation, we're gonna be attaching a carbon dioxide molecule to RUBP. Now I'm gonna be using these blue circles to represent a carbon molecule. So, or sorry, a carbon atom. So in this case, I have a one, two, three, four, five carbon molecule, and this is RUBP. So RUBP is a five carbon molecule, and over here I have a one carbon molecule. This is, of course, carbon dioxide, and what Rubisco is going to do, that's an enzyme, it's going to help fix this carbon dioxide molecule to RUBP. And when we say fix, what we really mean is like stick to, okay? So we can say Rubisco is an enzyme that fixes a carbon to RUBP, and I get a six carbon compound, one from the carbon dioxide and five from RUBP. Now, we'll talk about what happens to this six carbon compound in a minute, but I just wanna take a note to, or take a moment to give a little shout out to Rubisco here. Rubisco is what we believe to be Earth's most prolific enzyme. That means there's more of this enzyme than any other enzyme on Earth. And there's two reasons for that. One is it's pretty bad at its job. It's inefficient. <laughs> so we need, or not we, but photosynthetic organisms need a lot of it. And the second reason is because there's just a lot of producers. They form the base of the food chain and they have a lot of photosynthesis to do. So we have a lot of photosynthesis that's needed and we need a lot of this enzyme because it's inefficient. So Rubisco is our most prolific enzyme on earth. So here's how what we have so far, this carbon fixation process, five carbon plus one carbon gives me a six carbon compound. But before we move further, I just wanna take a note of what our end goal is here. The end goal of the Calvin cycle is to produce glucose. And here's my unbalanced um, photosynthesis formula. If I balance this equation, it turns out I'm actually going to need six waters, six carbon dioxides to make one glucose, and that'll give off six oxygens as a byproduct. So I don't actually need one carbon dioxide molecule here. I'm gonna need to do this six times. So I need six runs of the Calvin cycle. So so I'm gonna need six of these RUBP molecules. So the way that this will work, each RUBP molecule will pick up a carbon dioxide and then I will have six of these six carbon compounds, okay? Now, I keep saying six carbon compound. This is so unstable that I'm not even gonna bother naming it. It almost immediately comes apart. And this will break apart 
into compounds that have three carbons each, okay? So it's breaking up. And these are called glycerate three phosphates or G3Ps. I recommend you writing that out all the way like this. So I don't need to refer to it as a three carbon compound anymore. Now I know its name. So let's think about it. If I have six of these molecules and each one of them breaks in half, now I've got 12 of these G3Ps, these glycerate three phosphates. Now we're going to go through a reduction reaction and we're not actually going to change anything about the number of carbons. And so I'm not going to change the number of carbons or the number of molecules. I still only have 12 of these three carbon molecules, but they've been reduced. So the glycerate three phosphates are going to be reduced to form what we call TPs or triose phosphate. Okay, and so that's the name of this molecule. In the Calvin cycle, you do need to know the names of the intermediates. So if these get reduced, something else has to get oxidized. So what do we have that we can use and oxidize? I know <laughs> we can send in the reduced NADP. And so I'm actually going to spend 12 of those reduced NADPs and they're just going to go back into NADPs. So these NAD, these reduced NADPs get oxidized and they're transferring that energy, that electron to the G3Ps. I'm also going to end up spending 12 ATPs, okay? And we're gonna use that energy by breaking the third phosphate group off of ATP to further energize these G3Ps. So I've gotta spend 12 ATPs, that means I'm gonna end up with ADPs. And that also means that this TP, this is a much, much more high energy compound than the G3Ps. Where did this come from? Well, remember, these reduced NADPs and these ATPs are what we made in the light dependent reactions, okay? So those from the light dependent reactions, I'm gonna get rid of that, but hopefully you can remember where that came from. Now, two of these TPs are going to leave the cycle and these two TPs are going to be converted into glucose. And this is great because we know glucose is six carbons and I have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons to spend. Good, so I've made my one glucose molecule. That means I have 10 of these TPs left to continue the cycle. So the 10 TPs that are remaining are going to be used to regenerate RUBP. But because I have to break bonds and then make bonds and then rearrange all of these carbons, I need to spend some energy and that's going to come from the form of ATP. So just like I used energy carrying compounds to reduce the G3Ps, I'm also going to need to spend a little bit of energy to regenerate the RUBPs. And again, these energy containing compounds, the ATP and the reduced NADP, are what we had from the light dependent reaction. So that is why the light dependent and light interdependent or independent reactions uh, interdepend on each other, okay? That's, what they, that's how they are related. And before we move on with any of this, let's just make sure we're keeping our eye on the big picture. So we started off with carbon fixation, then we moved in to reduction, and we ended up with RUBP regeneration. And this is really the Calvin cycle in a nutshell. So now time for some recap and details. So the synthesis of triose phosphate, that's happening in this reduction part of my cycle where we're taking these G3Ps and we are reducing them to form the TPs, okay? These triose phosphates, so all of this is happening right here. And again, it is going to require us to use that reduced NADP and the ATP that we made in those light dependent reactions. That's why we needed those light dependent reactions in the first place.
Now let's focus in on this RUBP regeneration section of the Calvin cycle. Why are we doing that? <laughs> seems kind of silly, right? It seems like shouldn't we just take all of these triose phosphates and instead of making one glucose, why don't I just take all 12 of these and make six glucoses and forget about this remaking of the RUBP? Not a good idea, okay? So the reason why we have to do this, well not we, but the reason why photosynthetic organisms are doing this is because cycles are more efficient, okay? So if we think about how many times a plant is having to do this or a bacteria is having to do this, it needs to be as efficient as possible and cycles are much more efficient than linear pathways. So that means if we're gonna have a cycle, we need to regenerate this RUBP. So instead of using all of these triose phosphates for glucose production, most of them are going to um, be used to regenerate RUBP. And again, that requires the ATP that we made in the light dependent reactions. So we've simplified this a little bit, right? So I've said that, okay, we can make glucose using the Calvin cycle, and we can, not we, photosynthetic organisms can, um, and that glucose can be used for lots of things. It can be sent right over to the mitochondria to be used as a respiration substrate. We can put lots of glucoses together to make cellulose, and that makes up the cell wall, or it could even be stored as starch granules in like a root or a fruit or something of the sort. But guess what? Glucose isn't the only thing that can be made in the Calvin cycle. Instead of making glucose, these triose phosphates can also be used to make things like amino acids or lipids. Okay, they're gonna use a slightly different metabolic pathway and they may need to add additional minerals, but it's important to note that plants aren't a one hit wonder. They do more than make glucose. They can make other things too, using some of the products of this Calvin cycle. And I just cannot underestimate this enough. Theme C is all about interdependence. And so understanding how the light independent and light independent, light dependent reactions are linked, ugh, so important. So when we say photosystem one helps to create ATP, yes, now I see I'm using that in a couple of different spots, RUBP regeneration, and I'm helping to form those triose phosphates. When we say that photosystem one creates reduced NADP, exactly right. And that reduced NADP is going to be used in that reduction part of the Calvin cycle. So what one part needs, the other part uses, and that is what is really great about the interdependence of these two processes. And we'll end this video by just recapping this entire idea and like taking a look at this light intensity graph. So we know that light intensity is one of the limiting factors for photosynthesis, that as you make the light more and more intense, the rate of photosynthesis increases, but it plateaus at its maximum rate. So let's figure out why that is. In the first part of this graph, when light intensities are relatively low, the reason why photosynthesis is limited is because we're limited in how much ATP and reduced NADP you can make. So remember, that's from the light dependent reactions. And if I don't have a lot of light, I can't make a lot of the ATP and reduced NADP that I need. So as that light becomes more intense, I can make more of those things and I can make photosynthesis happen faster. Once I have a lot of those things, that's not the limiting factor. Up here at high light intensities, the reason why we get this plateau on our graph is because of this carbon fixation process. So remember we said that Rubisco is relatively inefficient. Well, here's where we kind of hit that limit, right? So there's only so much that Rubisco can do. It can only go so fast in fixating these carbons. So even though I might increase the light in intensity, it's not the lack of ATP or reduced NADP that's slowing me down. It's the action of Rubisco and the maximum speed of carbon fixation. So there's a reason why we get this classic plateau um, on our graph. And again, it has to do with the interdependence and interactions um, between both the light dependent and light independent processes.